If you don't notice, you know, Valentine's is just a couple of days away. And to be honest, I'll tell you, it's a day that stresses me out. Why? You're laughing because it probably stresses you out too. You're laughing because honestly, why does it stress me out? Because I'm always trying to think of what can I do for my lovely wife, Rachel? What is it that would tell her, show her, I appreciate her, I love her, within the budget, of course, right? Yep. All the husbands, amen. Within the budget, we got to remember. What, what, what can I do? And that might be you. You're trying to figure out, maybe it's not Valentine's, maybe it's not even your significant other, but you want to show somebody that you care for them. And you're thinking of, what can I do? What can I give? How can I show them? And I remember bringing this concern to Rachel, just telling her, this really stresses me out. And, you know, she would always encourage me, and she would tell me. She would say, you know, Paul, I don't need those big gestures. I don't know if this is a test, but... <laughs> so I'm kind of in the middle. She says, I don't need those big gestures or grand things. She says, you know what, you know what really makes me feel love? It's how you show up every day. It's how you love me and how you treat me in the everyday moments, how you show up. And we know this to be true if we have relationships with parents, uh, spouses, friends. The grand gestures and those things are awesome. They're amazing, but they quickly lose their significance and impact if there's not an everyday love, if there's not that consistency of love, and that's, that's something that we have to remember that uh, there is something that we, we, we have to focus on other than all these grand things. It's how we're showing up daily. See, I love the love stories. I love the rom-coms. I love that the guy gets the girl at the end through all the trouble and all that stuff. But I'll tell you, the real love story is found in the everyday, right? even with friends and, and, and significant other, whoever it is, the real love story is found in the intentional showing up every single day. It's an everyday love. And that's the love that God tells us to give. It's not a love that just shows up sometimes, but it's a love that's all the time. It's, it's a love that's demonstrated daily. See, we're to walk in the way of God, which is the way of love. Not just loving others on Sunday or when we feel like it. Not just on big events or milestones. But we love God and love others every day. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about an everyday love. See, last week we started a new series. It was a series that's called I Love You. And it's, it's a series that is challenging us to love others, that we would be the ones who are like Jesus, who intentionally love others first, that we would be relationship builders just like Christ. And the passage we're studying is Romans 12, 9 to 21. And Paul, he's teaching. We've actually been in Romans for quite some time, Romans 12. And Paul, is he, what he's teaching here, he's teaching how the gospel of Jesus Christ, it impacts how we love others, what love looks like in the life of others. And he prescribes to the believers, he prescribes to the church, this is what everyday love should look like. This is how you're to show up for the people in your life. This is how you're to show up, especially for the body of believers. We're going to get to the text so you can turn your Bibles to that area. But what I want you to remember as we're reading this text is, text is some of the history of the Roman church. I've said it before, but in this time, there is two bodies, two different culture groups trying to find their way as one body. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul, he writes this letter in 57 AD. But if we backtrack and go back in history, in 40 AD, the Jewish Christians were exiled from Rome. Claudius, the emperor there, tells them to leave Rome. So we're left with a church that's predominantly all Gentile believers. When Claudius dies, 54 AD, the Jews then come back. And now you have a church that has two different groups trying to figure out how to be one body. 
It's interesting that Paul writes this letter then three years later and he's, it's interesting that he talks about this. What should love look like amongst brothers and sisters? What should love look like against, uh, amongst the body of believers? And that's, and that's something that we're talking about today. How we are to love one another because his teaching on love is applicable to us today. So I want you to get your Bibles. Romans 12, 9 to 21. We'll be reading this passage. I'll be reading from the NIV version. Romans 12, 9 to 21. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God bless his word. Let's pray. God, today we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, Lord Jesus, that your word gives us life. It's your word that guides us and leads us. Today we take a moment to open our hearts, prepare our hearts to be good soil. We pray, Holy Spirit, be our teacher, guide us and lead us. I pray that I decrease and you increase in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be spending our time, we're gonna talk about this passage for the next couple of weeks, but we'll be spending our time today in verses nine to 13, looking at how Paul prescribes the church on what love should look like every day, how they should continuously show up for others. But before we get to the characteristics of what love looks like, we need to first understand and embrace this truth. That God's love, when we receive God's love in our life, it changes how we love others. We have to understand that. That yes, you come to Jesus as you are. You come to him and, and you receive him. His, his, his blood pays for the price of our sins. You come as you are. But when you accept his love into your life, it changes you. It changes how you love others. I'll tell you, it makes a heart of stone a heart of flesh. It gives you burdens and desires of Christ. God's love comes into you. And we have to first understand this because it's that love that we use to love others. It's the love that God gives us that he transforms us in. That is the love we use to love others. Others, so we have to embrace that group. God's love changes how we love. Let's look at Romans 12, 9. He said in the text, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Paul says, let love be sincere. Let it be genuine. In other translations, and I love the other translation, it says, let love be without hypocrisy. See, what is fake hypocritical love? Fake hypocritical love is a love that is full of words, but no action. It's a love that continuously says all these things, but there's no fruit. There's no impact. And I'll tell you, the church gets charged a lot of having hypocritical love. The church is charged a lot. To, a lot of people say that, oh, oh you Christians, you don't, you don't practice what you preach. The church gets charged with, there's a disconnect by what you're saying and how you're acting towards us. And though I do not believe that that blanket statement should be accepted, 
I don't believe that. But I do think it should cause us to constantly review our life. Is our love sincere? Is our love hypocritical? Is there a disconnect between what we are saying and what we are, or are, are professing and what we're actually doing? We have to ask ourselves a question. As followers of Jesus, as we are receiving his love, is it transforming how I love? Is it changing? Is, we have to ask ourselves, is my faith just about head knowledge, about religion and rules and laws, or is it about a relationship with Jesus? Am I becoming more like him? As I learn about him, as I walk with him, am I being transformed? We have to ask these questions because my friends, that's where the disconnect comes. That's when the hypocritical love comes in. We follow God with our lips, but not with our heart and our actions. See, we have to ask ourselves, that question. Matthew 12, 33 says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. I'll tell you, my experience and the experience of a lot of believers, when the agape, unconditional love of Christ fills your life, when you really are walking in relationship with Jesus, when the love that, that is kind and patient, that always trusts, always perseveres, that never fails, keeps no record of wrongs, when that love fills your heart and constantly, every day, filling you, changing you, I'll tell you, it changes your life as you are constantly experiencing the unconditional love of God. And as you draw from the sincere love of Christ, it starts to make your love more sincere, more and more sincere. You become like Jesus. You walk in this world like him. The love he extends to you, you extend to others. And I believe in this time with you and me, I believe that we will change the reputation of the church. The church will not be known for hypocrisy and scandal. But my friends, the church will be known for loving God and loving people, for being followers of the way of Jesus. That is what the church will be known for. But we have to walk with him. We have to be in love with him. We have to draw from him. I believe, you know, it's important to talk about because a sincere love that has no hypocrisy can only come from God. He is the only one who can love with no hypocrisy. He is the only one whose love is perfect. Jesus. We have to talk about this as we're talking about loving others. Because the way that Jesus describes to love others, I can't do with my love. Because my love is conditional. My love sometimes is hypocritical. But you see, Jesus' love, God's love, is not hypocritical. And that is what we draw from. That is what changes us to be able to love others. And I believe there are many in this room right now where God is calling you back to that sincere love. Where right now there's a pulling inside of you that says, I want to experience that love. I believe right now that God is calling you back to him, where you're wondering, how do I experience love in my marriage? How do I experience love for myself? How do I experience love for the people around me? I want to tell you, start with him. Run to him. That is the sincere love you're looking for. Draw from him, and it will help you to love others. I believe there's also people in this room where God is calling you to a deeper level of intimacy with him. Where he's calling you to be intimate to really know him. And you could be here saying, well, how do I be in more intimate with him? Or you could be here saying, Paul, I'm trying to be intimate. I'm trying to live this life for God, but like I don't feel close to him. I don't feel that passion. I don't feel that spiritual, that my spiritual walk is growing with him. And I'll tell you, yes, pursue him. Spend time with him. But there's also something that we need to ask. We have to ask, is there anything standing in our way 
from being intimate with God? Is there anything that's affecting our intimacy with him? What do I mean? Well, I know we're taking a marriage course right now with Alpha. If you're on that marriage course, God bless you. But we're taking a marriage course in Alpha, and I know through talking with my wife, through the timed conversations, that conflict impacts our intimacy. Like when there's conflict in our relationship, even though we're in relationship with one another, even though we see each other every day, even though we talk with one another, if there is conflict in our relationship, then it affects our intimacy. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's the same with God. You see, if there is something in your heart that's pulling you away from him, it'll affect your intimacy with him. If there's something in your life that's not pleasing to him, it'll affect your intimacy with him. You, we have to ask ourselves, is there any unrepented sin in my life? Is there anything that's not pleasing to him that I gotta get rid of? My friends, we, we have to know that it impacts our intimacy. You can't be in deep intimacy with a good God if you still have a relationship with evil. See, the intimacy that you're looking for will be found as you, can, you continually strip away everything that's not pleasing to God. You strip away everything that's causing unfaithfulness to God. As you strip it away, I'll tell you, you'll find yourself becoming more intimate with him. We have to turn away from our sin. Whatever it is, lust, unforgiveness, jealousy, destructive habits, Paul says in Romans 12, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Hate the evil things. The things you know causes you pain. Hate the things you know are pulling you away from God. Hate the things that you know don't fill your soul. Hate those things and cling. You know the word cling, it literally means to glue. Glue, cling to what is good. I hate evil, but the things that are good, the things that are God, I am sticking so close to it. It is not moving away from me. I hate evil, but I'm clinging to what is good. I talk to so many people, they want a deep relationship with Jesus. They want to go deep in relationship with him, but they still have their life with one leg in the world and one leg with God. Where they're loving God with half their heart, half their mind, half their soul. I want to encourage you, my friends. If you want to get into deep intimacy with him, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Turn away from the old ways. Live a new life with God. Follow his commands. Well, Paul, shouldn't God love me? Sometimes I have that question. Shouldn't God love whatever I do makes me happy? It makes me happy. Shouldn't he support everything I do in my life? Doesn't God love me? And I'll tell you, yes, God loves you unconditionally. Do not do not doubt that or second guess. God loves you unconditionally, but he will not stand for something that is destroying your life. That's what evil does. Yeah, it might make you happy, but sin ultimately leads to death. See, yes, his perfect love, he loves you, but it's a love that hates evil. He loves you so much, hates evil so much, but that, that God sent his son down to this earth for you and me to what? To defeat evil in our lives. That's how much he loves us. And that's how much he hates evil. That he would come to this broken world and he would give his life so that evil would no longer have a hold on us. So my friends, don't choose it again. Hate what is evil and cling to what God says is good. Galatians 6, 7 and 10, it says, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I love this verse. It tells us to, 
to follow what's good. And it reminds us this, that the good we are also supposed to cling to is the good of loving others, the good of serving others. This shouldn't surprise us, why? Because God's heart is for people. He loves people. The original design of all creation is what? That we would be in relationship with God and relationship with one another. That is the good design of God. I was reading in, in our global university course, I remember this phrase and they were, they were saying, one of the most accurate descriptions of Christianity in one word could be relationships. Because it's all about relationships. Relationship with God and relationship with one another. That's why Paul, in his teaching of sincerity of love, he then talks about how we're to love others. He then talks about what should love look like? As you receive the love of God, as it transforms you, what does sincerity of love look like in the everyday? And that's what I want to talk with you today. What should our everyday love look like? And he says it in Romans 12, 10. It says that love should be devoted. We should have devoted love for one another. It says be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And the word that Paul uses for devoted is the word that's only used once in the Bible. It's a, it's a word that in the Greek, it's phileo storgos. It's a love that is not just friendship love, but a love with deeper affection. It's a love that describes a love for a father and a mother, a mother and a father, a mother and a, and a son. It's a love of a family. And that's how he says we're to view one another. We're to be devoted to one another. We should look at one another like brothers and sisters. For we are one family with one father. And as born again Christians, we know that when we receive him in our life, his spirit is within us. And that spirit is what makes us all brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. See, I want you to look around to the people beside you, okay? Take a good look. Look around, okay, yeah, I see some heads. Online, just look around at the people in your house or think about the people at the church. Look around, you got a good look? We're good? Yep. You look around to the people around, beside you and all around you. These are not just friendly faces who have some free time and wanna come to church. But I wanna tell you, these are your brothers and sisters. You have to look around and you have to change how we see one another. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, we might look different. Some might be tall, some might be short. Some might be different colors. Yeah, we might have different upbringings. Yeah, we might have a different culture. But I'll tell you, if we have received Jesus, those things don't matter. They don't divide us. For we are one family with one Father. And as a family of God, what does that mean? Because you look around and say, yeah, they're my brother and sister. But that means we have a higher commitment to one another. You see, family doesn't come, take, and go. Family comes, stops shares, loves, gives. That is the commitment that Paul is saying to the Roman believers, that we look at each other as brother and sister. I love what Christ did for us. I love that he, he gave me a new life. I love that he forgave my sins. I love that he gave me a new identity and inheritance. But what I didn't expect in all of this love is that he gave me a new family that I didn't know I needed but I really, really did. See, that is a gift from God, the family of believers. And you could be here saying, I don't have a good father. I come from a broken home. I have no sisters. I don't have a good family story. I wanna tell you through Christ, you do have a family. You have many brothers, many sisters, many fathers, many mothers. That is the gift of Christ, that through him and his sacrifice, we are one family. We have a family, and I want to speak to the orphans today. You are not an orphan in Christ Jesus. You have people around you that love you. You are a family. Together, 
We have to change how we view one another. And I love this church. I'm a little bit biased, but I really believe that we are family. I really believe it. I really believe that we look at one another like brothers and sisters. Why? Because we're showing up in the hospital. We're showing up at the birthday. We're showing up when times are hard. We're showing up when times are good. We're laughing, we're crying, we're singing, we're dancing together. See, we are family. I wanna tell you, don't lose that. Continue to be devoted to one another. Brothers and sisters, my friends, this family is important. Just as important as your physical family. So I want to encourage you, Hebrews 13, 1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. The devoted love that God, Paul is asking is also to honor and value one another above ourselves. That's what the, the verse says. What Paul is talking about in the translation, if we were to translate that verse, it would come in our language more, uh, more accurately as be the first, lead the way in giving honor. Be the first to see others, appreciate them, value them in your actions, in your words. Be the first to do that. See, in a world where we are often looking for others to honor us, we have to lead the way. Be the example to honor and value others first. Imagine a world or even a church that would lead the way in honoring one another. Where encouragement, value, appreciation was given to one another. Where it wasn't about freely giving criticism, freely giving judgment, but it was about freely giving honor. Imagine how it would change our relationships. I want to ask you, who was the last person you honored? Who was the last person you built up? Who was the last person you, you valued and appreciated and you loved on them by doing it with words and actions? Who is it? Or have we been so consumed with ourselves? And I'm guilty of this. I remember repenting before God. I was like, who was the last person? See, we have to lead the way. As followers of Jesus, we have to be the first ones to honor. If you have something good to say, say it. If you're thinking good things about people, say it. You see, the things that we release are often the negative things we think about people. But somehow we keep the good things in. I want to tell you, if you're thinking something good, if there's someone in your life that you appreciate, honor them. Value them. Life is so hard. People are so discouraged. And sometimes you think, ah, they don't need it. They're strong. They can handle it. No, my friends, they need your encouragement. So honor them. Value them. Lift them up. A lot of the times we think it, which is good. But my friends, I can think all I want that my wife is good. But unless I tell it to her, it doesn't really have any impact to her. You see, a sincere, devoted love doesn't only think it, but says it. Doesn't only think it, but acts upon it. That is how we are to love, with a sincere love that honors one another. Who is it that you can honor? Think in your heart right now. I believe God is showing you in your life, I need to honor this person. I want you to honor them. Love them. Show them honor. Paul says also that love should be passionate. Romans 12, 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. He's telling the Romans here, don't be idle. Don't be reluctant in showing diligence. Don't lack zeal. Show some urgency. It says keep your spirit fervent. And that, that word fervent, it translates to boiling hot, bubbling over. Like, you know, when you're boiling water and it starts to bubble over, he's saying keep your spirit like that when serving the Lord. In other words, Everything that God asks you to do, everything he commands you to do, do it with passion. Don't delay. Do it with urgency in your heart. Serve uh, the Lord with passion. And I'll tell you, serving him doesn't just look like playing on the worship team. Serving him doesn't just look like doing production or guest membership. Serving him looks like serving others. 
And, and he's calling us to serve him in our workplace, in, in the grocery stores, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And how do we, what does that look like? It looks like serving others. You see, serving the Lord and loving him, following in his example looks like washing feet. It looks like caring for others, serving others. Galatians 5, 13 and 14, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So what Paul is saying to the Romans, he's saying, when you serve God, when God asks you to, to help somebody, when God's nudging in your heart, hey, you need to go help that person, you need to go feed that person, you need to go you pray for that person, don't delay. Do it today. See, we have to have urgency when following God. And that's why I wanna encourage you, if you have the time today, don't delay, do it today. If God has called you to do something, don't be idle, do it today. Don't delay. Do it today. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't delay, do it today. See, a Christian life, my friends, a Christian life, it's not an idle life. It's not a life that says, okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be. But it's a life that works. We are workers in the field. You see, Jesus' life wasn't an idle life, but he worked to do the will of his father. He worked passionately helping all those who were around him. So be passionate when it comes to serving others. Remind yourself that everything you do is unto the Lord. And some tasks might seem mundane. Some tasks you might not be thankful for. But it's God who sees you. It's God who calls you. That's how you keep your spirit hot when serving others. Because you know I'm not looking for their appreciation, but the appreciation of my master. It's him who, who I'm looking to please. So be passionate. And Paul also says be generous. Generous. Have a love that's generous. Romans 12, 13. Look at this. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Paul tells them you have to share not only in prayers, but also with material things. Also with your resources, your time, everyday love should be a generous love. A love that's willing to give away. And we always have to come back to this because our economy is getting tougher and tougher. And there's this temptation to continue just to hoard and save for myself. But a life that is not generous is not a life of love. It's a life of greed. See, we have to love by being generous, by giving away. It's how God made us. We were made to be givers. Say, say to yourself, I was made to be a giver. It's true. You know, science even agrees with it. You know, as you give, what happens to you? These feel-good chemicals are released inside of you that makes you feel good. You know, if you're having a bad day, be generous. It doesn't sound like that would work out, but that's God. That's how he made us. That when we give away, we love like him. Hebrews 13, 16. And do not forget to do good and share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. I love this. Do not forget. Because it's easy to forget with all of our needs. But instead of asking, who will bless me today? Who will serve me today? Ask, who can I give to? Who can I help? Who can I give my money, my resources, my time away to? Love should always be generous and love should be hospitable. See, when Paul says practice hospitality, when I was studying this passage, it was so interesting. That word pass, uh, practice actually means aggressively chase after it. I said, whoa, aggressively chase after hospitality? Sometimes we aggressively run away from hosting. <laughs> but he says, aggressively chase hospitality. What does that mean? Create the spaces and places where love and care are. Have meals with people. Break bread. This is the way of Jesus. Especially with people you don't know, believers who you don't know. Open your home. Have them in. 
aggressively chase hosting them in your life? Open your life. How do strangers become friends that eventually become family? Somebody practice hospitality. Somebody takes the initiative to open their life. Somebody says, come over. Let's have dinner together. Or if you don't have a house, let's go grab some coffee. See, somebody practices hospitality. I want to tell you, in a world today where people are looking how to build relationship, practice hospitality. Aggressively chase it. Be the one to invite people in. Be the one to, to create those places. Let's remember what Jesus told us in Matthew 25. When we serve even the least of our brothers and sisters, we do it for him. So aggressively chase it. Deep relationships are not formed by the casual highs and byes and the passing how are yous, but they're formed over the dinner table, breaking bread. There is no shortcut to relationship, my friends. This is the way of Jesus. We have to practice hospitality. You know, as every day God fills us, that sincerity of love, it changes us, transforms us, and causes us to love in a, in a way where we are devoted, in a way where we're passionate, in a way where we are generous. I'll tell you, any of these things that I have just talked about, it, if it, it drops from your head to your heart to your hands, you'll see it changes the relationships around you. If you actually said, I'm going to put this into practice, your life will change. But you could also be here saying, well, but what about my needs? I'm facing a hard time right now. It's hard for me to look at the needs of others when I got my own stuff going on. And sometimes you could be here saying, hey, it's hard for me to love because I'm feeling weak. I have my own tribulations. I love that in the midst of it all, in this passage, Paul, he takes a moment in verse 12. If you have your Bible, I want you to circle verse 12. Because the moment of, of him prescribing to love others, he takes this moment to remind the believers the posture in which they can continue to love others. He reminds them and encourages them in Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That might be you today. You might be going through affliction or tribulation. You might be going through a hard season. I want to remind you that you can have joy, that, that, that we can be joyful in our life because we have a living hope. May that remind you, I have this, let me, you know, sometimes people talk about, you ever heard the analogy of the glass? When you look at this glass, okay, in your life, when you're looking at the situations in your life, you can look at this glass and the glass, the water is to this level right here. You can look at this, this glass and say, hey, take the view of an optimist. My life and my situation, hey, the glass is half full. Or you could take the, the, the position and view of a, let's not say pessimist, let's say realist, and say the glass is half empty. You see, we could take these views of our life and look at the situation how it is right now. But I want to encourage you. As believers, as people who follow God, our eyes are not on the glass. Our eyes are not on the level of water. But my friends, our eyes are on the one who holds the water, who holds the source of all things. So I want to tell you, you can look at this glass and say, it doesn't matter if it's half empty. It doesn't matter if it's half full. Because my hope is not in my situation, but my hope is in the one who holds all things things. See, I want to encourage you. That's why you can be joyful in hope. Because your, your faith isn't on what is seen, but what is unseen. And your God is alive. Your God is faithful. Your God will fill up your cup. I want to encourage you today that you can be joyful in hope. And let that cause you to be patient when you're facing trials. Patient in affliction. Knowing that God won't forsake you. In those times, in the pressure, his righteous hand will uphold you. Be patient. Don't lose hope. Endure with Jesus. Just like his suffering produced the greatest good in this world, 
Know that there is a plan that he has for you. Be patient. And through it all, don't give up on praying. See, a lot of us are tired and weary simply because we do not pray. We carry things that we're not meant to carry. See, Jesus is meant to carry a lot of the things in our life. We rely on ourselves and our emotions, but my friends, it's in the place of prayer where we exchange with God. Where we don't only give him our concerns, our worries, ask for things, but we get more of his presence. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his presence, there is strength. In his presence, there is peace. So don't give up praying. Continue to pray. In your afflictions and needs, pray. In, 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 in loving and serving others, be faithful to pray. Romans 4, 6 to 7. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. See, that's the posture we're to take. It's a posture of joy and hope, a posture of dependence. That's the posture we could take so that in every day we can still love others. See, as I close and call up the worship team, you might be going through a hard time right now. But my friends, that's not an excuse to not love others. It's not an excuse not to love with, with God's love that he gives us. There will always be troubles in your life until, until the day we are with our master in heaven. So if you're waiting for that perfect moment where my life is perfect and I have no worries and I'm all carefree, then you, before you serve others and love others, you will end up living a life where you have loved and served no one. Because there's never gonna be the perfect time to love somebody. Love is a decision. Love is a choice. Love is, comes from God. Love is, is, is what we choose as God fills us, what we extend to others. And as followers of Jesus who have the agape love within us, may it lead us to love with devotion. May it lead us to love with passion. May it lead us to love with great generosity. Not just one day, every day. The question I wanna leave us with as we go into this next week, and how can you better love the people in your life? Not just in your life, but more importantly, the person beside you, the person behind you, the people around you. How can you better love them? How can you show up for them not just on Sundays, but every day. I wanna also encourage you if, you, if you feel today that you need to, a fresh experience of that sincere love of God, maybe I'm preaching about it and you're like, I need that in my life. I need to feel the presence of God again. I need his love to fill me. I wanna tell you, he died for you, he cares for you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He made a way for us to commune with him. He paid the price for you. And he wants to have a relationship with you.